Christine Jones, I'm a Republican candidate for governor. And if you would do me two things, one, if you're not opposed to sitting next to the person that you don't know, move towards the center aisles so we can keep it clear for people that come later. You know, they ask us to do that in church and everybody goes, well, but I don't know. I didn't see that. I got here really far and listened to your seat. So I respect that totally. Okay, they can climb over you if they come later. The second thing is, would you stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Our new friend Monty is going to lead us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it may not be, I might not lead you the same stilted way you learned in school. So please follow. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Left to the other campaigns. 
and thank you. And one of the things that I think we should celebrate that is distinctly good and uniquely Arizona is the work that the Pinal County Sheriff's Office has been doing. Now you may know that just a few weeks ago they arrested eight drug cartel scouts. And he's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but what he won't say because he's too humble to admit it is, it is this is the first time in the history of American law enforcement that a sheriff's office has done an operation like this, captured, and now the county attorney is prosecuting major leadership from a drug cartel from Mexico. And so with that, would you help me welcome and thank Sheriff Paul W. for coming? you, but I, I think you'd agree that I've had just about enough uh, with, with everything that has gone on, and I thought that I already had my hands full in Pinell County. Uh, our deputies and all of our partners in law enforcement, uh, not only fighting the drug cartels, and, and we'll share some of those stats with you. We had the largest drug bust in the history of Arizona, not just going after the scouts, who are different than the, the actual smugglers who are carrying the drugs. These are people on mountaintops, right? Who, like in the military, in LPOP, who here has served in the military? Raise your hand. Juan, thank you and God bless you. For your service. I can tell you, uh, over a 50 mile swath of territory from just north of Tucson in the Moran area. Uh, Red Rock, Picacho, you go up I-10, you head west, towards Arizona City, Casa Grande, that whole area, and then west on Interstate 8. This is where we arrested eight cartel scouts. Uh, each one of them was on their own mountain, and they had not just cell phones, they had digital encrypted communications, their radios. Our sheriff's office don't even have encrypted radios, okay? And they had high-powered binoculars that they can see not just direct line of sight for a mile or two, try 10 miles, okay? And what they were doing, they weren't carrying the drugs. They were living there 10 days to 30 days at a time, even in this extreme heat. And they were paid 100 bucks every time they went from this mountain to that mountain to that mountain. The, the drugs were passing safely. You get paid 100 bucks every time. And so this is the robust operation that we're fighting. And it almost sounds like I'm describing a war-torn area like Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. The fact, this isn't, uh, and I know all of us here from uh, Yavapai County, uh, Pinal County is not on the border either. We're 70 miles north of the border, okay? This is deep into the heart of our state. And that how have we arrived at this point in America where our federal government has accepted this, where that job, that duty has fallen to the local sheriff as, as his responsibility and the responsibility of our deputies, right? And this is unacceptable. The response we get from the federal government, there are dozens of these signs, as, you're, as we're talking tonight, these signs are in my county, warning American citizens written in English facing north towards Phoenix that travel caution, drug and human smuggling on American soil. And, and, and some of you may have heard this before, and I, I say it somewhat sarcastically, even though it probably wouldn't do any good, face them south towards Mexico, written in Spanish, warning the drug cartels to stay out, it's against the law, right? This is insulting to all of you men and women who raise your hand, or anybody who has somebody who served our nation in the military, has worn the uniform of our country and has defended our country, right? That is insulting to America. And the fact that we have people in our government who are defeatists, who say this border can't be secure, while they're pronouncing it is secure, there's also, as I, I, I confronted Janet Napolitano down in Nogales one time, and she said, Sheriff, and she shot back at me. This is when she was Homeland Security Secretary. This border will never be secure. There has been smuggling and contraband since the beginning of time on this border. And this is my response, not only to her, to the president, to Eric Holder, is I reject that defeatist approach. We are a republic. 
and we run this government. <laughs> about time, and I think I have a little bit more standing to say this because as an Army officer, I served our country for a tour in Iraq. And we've spent enough time in Iraq and Afghanistan and all these other countries fighting, protecting, and defending their people. It's about time we put America first and fight, defend, and protect our own border here in America. Yeah. you, and I'll talk about the scouts and, the, and all these other things that we've been doing, what's so refreshing about Christine Jones, because some of you are very aware, and some of these yelled at me the other night when I, Christine was there at one of these events, you said the same thing with John McCain and build the dang fence and all of this, and I said, look, I was betrayed, and I feel that way, yeah. and I'm telling you this, and I'm being upfront and honest with you that... Look, a lot of people who run for office or run for re-election do this dance for us. And sometimes we even grow to accept it, that it's a part of the process in our country. And we have no reasonable expectation that they're actually going to do it once they get back in. And the reason why I trust Christine, she's not a part of this whole mess, right? She's running because there's problems that she wants to solve. She has a proven track record in the private sector to do these things. Many good candidates in this race, I know all of them personally, and I think they're tremendous individuals who love our state, love our country. All of them that personally ask me, either on the phone or face-to-face, -face, for my endorsement, my support of their campaign, except this young lady right here. You know what she has? Young lady. Yes. <laughs> she asked me for advice. She asked me for input. Sheriff, what is it going to take? And she hasn't just asked me, she asked all day. She's talked to all sheriffs. She's talked to military leaders. She's talked to government officials. She's talked to Border Patrol. You'll hear all that. And it's like that's refreshing to me because at a time that I've lost a lot of faith, certainly in the federal government. Because they're not going to solve this. And this is where I truly believe that this plan is so bold that there, no, no governor of, of the four southwest border states has done something like this. And you're going to hear about the plan where she has the legitimate power and authority as the commander in chief of the Arizona National Guard. There's over 5,000 Army soldiers, there's over 2,200 airmen in our National Guard. 80% of us are combat veterans. Many of our returning veterans are unemployed, okay? I've been trying to hire a lot of them in our sheriff's office in Pinell County. What a, is there a better purpose to put our own National Guard, give them jobs, give them the honor and respect, and I believe it's as important, in fact, more important than some of these other missions in foreign lands, right here in our own state, protecting, guarding, and defending their home state of Arizona. One back. I'll talk, there's a lot of there's a lot of nuances about this deployment and what it would take, and, and Christine can speak to that, and I'd be happy to speak to it. I'm now a retired Army major, but I lived in Yuma for a year as a commanding officer. I was I was honored and privileged to serve our country there. Uh, and we had 700 active duty soldiers and airmen. And they were from all across the country that were supporting this mission. This proposal by Christine is an Arizona National Guard pure mission. It would be paid for by the state. And you're going to hear about that. And, and you have to approve this because you're the bosses, right? Every other mission was paid for by the federal government. That's where soldiers have been called back and there's been sporadic enforcement. I can tell you what happened in Yuma because I lived there because there was a lot of misinformation. They said, uh, certain politicians said, well, these troops don't even have bullets in their guns. Have you heard that before? I can tell you, as I'm standing here, I was a commanding officer. Every soldier, every airman had 130 rounds, okay? There was a 30-round magazine or clip seated in the well of that weapon. And each, what we call EIT site, Entry Identification Team, there were three to five in this location, direct line of sight, 
to their left limit, quarter mile away, there was another three to five. Direct line of sight, three to five. And it went like a human shield, right? They had a military vehicle at each location. And that night, we had a bank of lights that lit them up. Completely, all of us who served in the military, or even members of the, the citizens we serve, this is nothing like we've ever been trained to do. But it worked. We were a show of force, much like when you see uh, myself in uniform or any officer in our state that you recognize their authority by their uniform, by their presence, right? And it's the it's, it's uh, rules of force for law enforcement. The first step is by their mere presence, and oftentimes that's all that's needed. And, and you don't have to go further than see a cop car on the highway, right? What's your reaction? Your foot comes off the gas pedal. <laughs> Literally, I, I swear to God, even to this day, I'm in civilian clothes. I do the same thing when I see a guy. I just do it. And this is where, in, in the military, I would troop the line, meaning I'd go from that site to this site to that site to inspect, to talk to the, the senior enlisted or the sergeant on, on the site. And they would say to me, Major B, because they couldn't pronounce Babu. they say, Major B, and they'd give me an update, and I'd ask them, what have they seen? And almost always, there'd be, there'd be uh, service members from Minnesota and all these other states, and they say, Major B, and they look down. We, we haven't seen any activity in the, the three weeks that we've been here. And I would chuckle, and they think that somehow something's not working. And I said, that's exactly what we want. Yeah. Amen. And the difference here, and this is why it works, because those soldiers are not given law enforcement authority, and a lot of people think that they have to have it. Given our Constitution and the protections, the safeguard for our Republic, for military on our own soil, posse comitatus, they don't need that authority. Because of their show of force, and once you understand this, you're going to know more than Janet Napolitano or Barack Obama about what it takes to secure the border. They're on the border, not 40 miles, 50 miles north of the border, right? They're armed. People in Mexico, Central America, any other nation, they fear their own military and their culture. We don't fear our military, we love our military, right? Absolutely. So we're using this to our advantage, this, this show of force and the authority, just like you recognize an officer. The last person who wants to see a guy like me is a criminal in our communities, right? They will avoid, they will scram, right? What do you think people like drug smugglers or human smugglers, the like coyotes, the last person they want to see is somebody who's going to apprehend them or going to alert the border patrol. They don't want to be observed. So this is why my soldiers, for a year and a half, we haven't seen anybody. The result is 97% reduction in illegal entries and drug smuggling in the Yuma sector, where I, was, where I served as a commanding officer. That is a secure border. There's no soldiers, there's no airmen there today. And that's where we understand a key military principle. Once you own the land, you don't give it up. And it's far more easy to maintain, right? We all understand that. That's what worked in Yuma. So I'm giving you that example called the proof of concept, meaning that worked. Christine Jones, that's a part of her plan. We're not sending soldiers to Yuma when she's elected governor in January. She's going to send them to the Tucson sector, where just over a year ago there were 123,000 illegals that were apprehended just here. You're in the Tucson sector if you didn't know it. 123,000 were apprehended. In law enforcement, we call that a clue. <laughs> that the border is not more secure than ever, right? So all these things, and in fact, uh, I was on Mike Groom that coming up, and he said, Sheriff, have you heard this, this uh, tape by Harry Reid, the senator from the majority leader? I said, no, I haven't heard it. And he goes, well, please qualify your remarks and know that you're on live radio before you respond to what he's saying. He, honest to God, said, that this border is absolutely unconditionally secure. That I swear to God, how divorced from reality are these people? And so this is what I said, uh, not, not only there, uh, time and time again, you're going to hear the same thing from me each and every time, is that for all of us, we have to abide by the law, right? That you expect that law enforcement 
officer, they enforce the law equally for everybody here. And it does. If I didn't enforce the law on you, by the way, that law enforcement officers in Arizona have law enforcement authority throughout the entire state, right? Yes. But I'm not trying to do the job of Sheriff Scott Masher here, because he's a dear friend. He does a great job. That if, if I didn't enforce the law on you, say you did something to violate the law, everybody else, what message does that send to you? Let's do it too. Let's do it too. And this is, in fact, on a large scale, what is now 60,000, the federal government is predicting by October 1st, it'll be 90,000 unaccompanied juveniles from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, just from those three countries. What is that number from there? Right? Because their very hope was realized when they were welcomed with open arms. Right? They weren't turned away. There are no consequences. And this is why the rule of law has been undermined. There is no law. If you're, if you're disrespecting our country and our immigration process and you come here, there is no law anymore. So this is why you think 60,000 or 90,000 is a big number, put your seatbelt on. That's what's coming our way. And the president has asked for $3.7 billion, and this is where I just said, throw that money out the window, and it's just as valuable, right? Because it, it's not even a one-time fix. Why don't we put that money into securing the border and fix this problem once and for all? Mayor Christine says, talk about what happened in Oracle. Okay, we had competing protesters, and I got yelled at by both groups this morning. Uh, one group wanted me to arrest the bus drivers and everybody on the buses, and then the other group wanted me to get run over by the buses. And Things uh, the federal government never did all this in secret. They they never told me. They never told anybody in our state government that they were going to fly in from Texas, 40 to 60 of these unaccompanied juveniles. And by the way, they're coming to Pinell County in Oracle, a, a small community. Most of our we were about 420,000 residents. We're a little bit larger than Yavapai County. And this small town is unincorporated, so we're the ones who respond to the calls. There's only 5,000 people in this town, okay? So this is a group home, and they're putting these kids here, and we have no idea their background, any criminal history, the public health issues possibly associated here. I just want answers, information, and I've been denied this by any official I'm asking in the federal government. So. Whistleblowers called me, told me this information. We called the Sycamore Creek uh, Boys Ranch and they confirmed that yes, in fact, they're coming. And we've hired 30 additional staff to prepare for it. So we knew that this was a fact. And I was telling Christine, they're even lying about it tonight. We never intended anybody to be sent out there. And I've got the press release that the boys camp put out earlier this morning, mm -hmm. right? Besides, I talked to their lawyer. And it, it, it's just a sham. So. They're coming, and I think they're trying to do it in the cover of darkness or, or whatever. But as I started out, we've got enough issues. We don't need additional issues. What I believe should have happened with these 60,000 unaccompanied juveniles, yes, put them on a plane, but return them to the country of origin. And so, so here, I told Christine, sign me up. I will go wherever you need me to go because we need a leader that's actually going to do something about this because she said, Sheriff, this isn't going to happen by President Obama. And I said, I know that. <laughs> and she said, as the governor, this is my plan. And that's such a bold plan. And this is truly the Tenth Amendment that's going to return our country to where it needs to be. And when all these defeatists who say it can't be done, this young lady is going to show our country that it can be done. And it's going to be a shining example. Of Thank you. To put in perspective what the sheriff is talking about down in Pinal County, we were there last night at a very similar gathering to this one. And it was in Saddlebrook. Do you guys know where Saddlebrook is generally? Yeah. How many miles away from, are you from Saddlebrook? Yes. How many miles is Oracle from where you live? Well, actually, we live at the ranch. 
It's really important because, as the sheriff mentioned, it is a universal human condition that when you see somebody in uniform, you show respect. Now, the one gentleman down here said he does not take his foot off the gas when he sees a police officer because he never speeds. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just crossed his heart. <laughs> you should follow him out of here tonight. <laughs> calls us when they have a flood, a hurricane, a tsunami, some warlord who's pillaging a, a village, some kind of international incident where they need our help, and they do call us, right? We go bail everybody out. If we can help protect the borders of Iraq and Afghanistan, could we not agree that we can protect our sovereign national border? show of force. The second piece happens that my husband's a career military officer who moved around the country for a long time. We landed here in the 90s. I joined a law firm. In late 2001, I got recruited to go to this tiny little startup company with the crazy name GoDaddy. I know, that's what I said when they called me. I'm not going to go anyway. We grew that company from just a few dozen employees to about 4,000. All of those jobs, well, not all, most of those jobs right here in Arizona. I learned a lot about technology over the last decade. There are readily available technologies we can put in place today. Here's another straightforward, Christine speaking the truth to you statement. Technology doesn't secure. Technology doesn't stop anybody doing anything. What technology does is help us monitor who's coming and going. This is half the battle. Because about 50% of the people that are in this country illegally today are here because they've overstayed a visa. They came legally, they stayed illegally. We've got to know who they are, where they are, and how to get them to become compliant. Monitor everything from burying cables under the ground to surveillance in the sky and everything in between. In between includes cameras, infrared, and so on. Third piece. We have to finish the fence in key places. Now, we don't need the Great Wall of Mexico here, folks. We don't. There are many miles of terrain in the desert that are impassable. Natural barriers, mountains, some of it's Indian Reservation. There are many miles that don't need a fence, period. People can't exist there, they can't survive there, but there are strategic places where we must have a physical barrier. Again, the physical barrier is much like the National Guard. It serves as a support to Sheriff Matthew and his colleagues because you put up a vehicle fence, you can't drive a Jeep or a truck or a semi full of drugs across that part of the border. You put up a pedestrian fence, even if the people are going to climb it or cut through it or go under it, it serves as a delay. That gives those National Guard troops the ability to radio to a local law enforcement guy who comes and makes the arrest, the apprehension. This plan works. It has been proved out in the U.S. sector. The U.S. sector is probably the single most secure sector along the entirety of the 2,000 miles that this country shares with Mexico. Why would we not repeat that? Why wouldn't we do it again? It worked. It's been proved, this concept. So, troops, technology, defense, these three things together, we can get this thing done as a state with authority under the law to do this. Here's the rub. It's expensive. It's going to cost about $270 million to build the fence, to install the technology, to fund the local law enforcement, the sheriffs, the county attorneys, the attorney general to prosecute crimes. And you are going to have to pay for it. I have to say, we've had this conversation a lot. You're the very first person who suggested snipers. What do you think, Chair? Are you going to sign up for the snipers? So here's what we say. The 270 
million. And by the way, the 50 million to build the fence and the, 50, and the 40 to 50 million for technology is a one-time cost. You are already spending 2.8 billion. That number a few years ago was 1.8 billion. And in a few more years, it's gonna be 3.8 billion. And then it's gonna be four, and it's gonna be five. And pretty soon, the number that you spend incarcerating, educating, and providing medical services for people who are citizens of other countries is going to be as large as the entirety of the state's budget, which today is about $9 billion. I don't know about you, but I think we're gonna take about 10% of it and get this thing secure. Yeah. Okay. The other piece, and I'm looking for the person that asked this question about sending Obama the bill. Oh, there you are. Okay. This is a federal government function. I talk a lot about being a fierce defender of the Constitution. I talk a lot about the Tenth Amendment. I've actually read the Constitution, and I know what it says. It says the states have every single right reserved to them that's not specifically allocated to the federal government. Happens, this is one of those states the federal government's supposed to do. They are supposed to secure the border. However, in as much as they are not doing it, we're gonna pay for it ourselves. We're just gonna say, you know what? This is like when you buy your kid the dog. You say, I'll get you the dog, but you gotta go clean up after in the backyard. There goes mom cleaning up in the backyard. There goes mom cleaning up the backyard. Yeah, this is what you do. We're gonna pay for this. We will send them the bill. This is their expense. This has been tried before. Napolitano sent a bill to President Bush. I personally think it was a political maneuver, but nevertheless, she tried it. It's funny. She didn't make any effort to pay back when she was, you know, in, so. <laughs> This is a federal expense. But even, even if they don't pay it back, and by the way, I have a tendency to be pretty tenacious, a little feisty, and a lot outspoken. I will dog them on this thing. But even if they don't pay it back, wouldn't we pay it? Wouldn't we, wouldn't we save ourselves this money and return this to what? services for Arizona, education, back to the taxpayers, things that are meaningful to the people who are citizens of this country. That is my commitment, and that's the answer to that question. All right, speaking of questions, there's a microphone here. If you'd like to, we're gonna take some questions. If you'd like to take questions, James, my colleague, say hi James, is going to host, and if you wanna just form a line and uh, start asking some questions, we'd be happy to entertain those at this time, thanks. Christine, the you declared the Tenth Amendment, what's to stop us from turning around and making everybody that is going to our schools prove citizenship? That we can go ahead and take their names and all of those that are not and send it to the federal government as a bill. There is a specific federal statute on point says that states may not deny education even to children who are undocumented immigrants. It's a specific directive from the federal government. Now, this is another example of federal government overreach. It's everywhere you look. It's Common Core in education. It's Obamacare in medicine. It's the EPA with the environment. It's the BLM with land management. Everywhere you look, it's federal government overreach. This is a perfect example of it. Nevertheless, how about let's do this in line with the law? If we want to change the law, let's go change the law. And I think in some of these cases we should. We're going to do what we can do as a state to make this thing right. Monty. Thank you, Christine. Um, I've heard nothing but good that you and your information that you're giving us, I have heard nothing that I do not agree with. I do have a question. Do you have the infrastructure of your organization already in place to prevent what has happened to other conservative-minded people whom we have supported in the past becoming first Republican in name only? 
and then having to cave to the pressure to do things against what you just said, against things that would limit government and give us more of the individual sovereignty we're supposed to have. It's a great question, and obviously we're making trying to simplify this, and it's a very complex issue. The, the land and border, as you know, is a patchwork of different types of land. There's Indian reservation, there's military, there's private land, there's state land, there's federal land. It's a complicated issue, okay? I invite you to go read the, the, the summary of the plan is sitting at the table out there. I invite you to go to christinejones.com to read the whole plan. I have. And by the way, it's actually a plan, not three bullet points on top of the page. I have read it. I love it. Not to be <laughs> commentary on other people's plans, but I would, uh, first I would encourage you to do that. The second thing is, you just have to judge me based on my past, on the totality of my life circumstances. The best single example I can give you is the NSA. You guys all heard of Edward Snowden. Yeah. The reason I made the NSA joke before is because if you look at the list of internet companies that participated in that scandal, Every major internet company is on the list. Google, Yahoo, AOL, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, YouTube, Skype, on and on and on. There's one major internet company missing. Anybody want to guess who it was? Google. Go Daddy. Because when the NSA came to me and said, hey Christine, wouldn't it be nice if we could put our box in your data centers? And by the way, to put this in perspective for you, today, GoDaddy provides technology services for 12 million small businesses all over the globe. About a third of the traffic on the whole internet passes through GoDaddy servers every day. It's a big deal. They really wanted access to it. It would have made it very convenient for them, I assure you. When they said that, you know what I said? No. Just no. Because I've read the Constitution, and I know what it says, and I understand that you as a law-abiding citizen have a right to be protected against unreasonable search and seizures called the Fourth Amendment. Now, this is serious stuff, friends. We're talking about securing our border. We're talking about protecting the rights of law-abiding citizens. Think about how serious this NSA thing was. The NSA it was one that wasn't a bunch of fat guys in, in t-shirts sitting around listening to people's phone calls. No offense to the fat guys. <laughs> Sorry, that was. <laughs> I once said that to the direct director of the NSA, and he thought it was very funny too, but... <laughs> this was about preventing a terrorist attack. This was about preventing another 9-11. No one wants that. This is really serious stuff. But in the balance between home, homeland security and privacy rights and protecting the rights of law-abiding citizens, I had to come down on the side of your constitutional rights. That's not to say if they came to me with a subpoena or a search warrant or a search order or some document from a court of competent jurisdiction, I wouldn't help them. I did. We cut lots of bad guys together. And you know what? They complied with the Constitution every single time. Magic. So what do we do to the federal government? We say, you know what? I've read the book. It's only this thick. In a paperback. And you have one in your, it's so small he has it in his shirt pocket. If, if you go back to the document and you do your analysis based on that and you say to the federal government, and by the way, you have to be diplomatic about this, okay? You have to be a professional. You have to, you have, to have a plan. But if you do it, they'll cooperate. It's like magic. Every single time they needed something, they gave me a search warrant. And they had gone to a judge, and they had sworn out an affidavit, and they had stood up probable cause, and that's what we're going to do when we interact with the federal government in this state going forward. And, and it was not a blanket warrant. No, 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 no. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Ed Wolf. And Hi, Ed. Personally, I'd like to work on the campaign. I would like for you to work on my campaign. Uh, but, uh, my, my question or statement is that during, uh, right after World War II, President Truman uh, deported millions and millions of people out of the country to make way for returning soldiers from World War II so that the job market was open to our citizens. Then also, President Eisenhower 
had an operation called Operation Wetback and deported millions again. So I'm sick and tired of this argument where they say, how are you going to get rid of 20 or 30 million people? In this day and age, with all the technology that we have, we could duplicate what they did back in 1945 and 51 and 53. And we could do that with, with all of this kind of uh, technology and, and law enforcement and everything else. This is a plan to overwhelm this country by two people known as Cloward and Pivot. And these two people have devised a plan and they're teaching right now in the colleges, spreading their cancer on how to bring down capitalism. Uh, and it's called overwhelm the system. And that's what they're doing with all of our social <coughs> services to the tune of 2.8 million and probably higher than that. So I would say this, if we can get a lot of people out of here, we can knock that down to zero. But the thing is, is that that's part of the plan too, and I hope that you'd incorporate that in your whole program. Could, could you guys hear what he was talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and you're familiar, there were three presidents who actually have yeah, engaged this very specific plan of deportation to clear jobs for Americans returning from war or during times of war. Again, I'm gonna just answer you straightforward. I'm not a politician, so I get to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if there's any politicians in there. Actually, one guy said to me, you know, Christine, the minute you filed to run for governor, you became a politician. <laughs> and then he said <coughs> something I will never forget. He said, just be a good one. <laughs> so here's the truth about that. Would I love to engage something like that? You bet. I personally think the single most humanitarian thing we could do for these little kids is put them on a plane and send them home to be reunited with their families. There's an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or somebody that wants that kid back. But I don't have authority to do that as the governor of this state. Now, I suppose I could put them on a bus and send them back to Texas, a step one in the deportation process. <laughs> I mean, does that really get us anywhere, if we're being honest? What we have to do is we have to tolerate the last two years of this administration, because we got ourselves into this. We, we, we the people did. Yeah, we did. I didn't, well, yeah. Is there an Obama voter anywhere in this room? <laughs> To, to talk about once and for all, what are we going to do with immigration policy? Because clearly the Congress is not fixing it at the moment. And, and it is specifically, even as much as I like to talk about the 10th Amendment, that particular thing is, by the states, reserved to the federal government. Why can't we send them to D.C.? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ralph Johnson. I'm a retired uh, police officer, and I really respect your job and uh, understand the problems you're having with bus people and the, you know, the people who are out down there protesting. It's really tough when you have to handle both sides. Thank you. The real thing I would like to direct to you is securing our border. That's what we want to do. The problem that you had with Yuma, it went real well because you had people every, but now we have a different problem. We can have uh, National Guardsmen every five feet. We need a neutral area where when these people are coming through, we can turn them right around and send them right back then. No expense to us except what we have there. And do not bring them into our, our country. The, the problem is they're walking up to us. They want us to arrest them. So, so the thing that they had in Yuma is not going to really work what the problem we're having now. You said 60,000 people, another year it'll be another 60,000 or 90,000. This is a big problem and nobody has a solution. We need a neutral area where we can turn them back before we ever get into a big expense. The 3.7 billion that Obama wants, oh my God, we could secure and have the China, China, you know, wall, you know? But anyway, that's my, my feelings. I watch news all the time. I hear Governor Perry with the same problem. Your hands are tied. The government's going behind your back. 
either sending these kids anywhere they want to, and you, you as the governor have no authority to stop it. He has to maintain law. It, it's, it's, it's terrible. And I, I thanks for running anyway. <laughs> A couple of things. I think the experience of the units down in Yuma proved that the show of force substantially reduces the number of people who will walk up and ask to be caught. And that was the point of these kids from Minnesota who, <laughs> who said, I haven't seen a single solitary human being in three weeks. I think that is the point of that. Now, does this become somebody else's problem? Possibly. But my, my hope and my intent is to work with the other border state governors so that they all implement exactly the same kind of plan. And then, it, and then it becomes untenable for the crossing into America, at least across that border. And maybe you want to talk about the reduction of the immigration. Both. And, and the reason why I consider this a gentleman who raised it for everybody else who's listening is this whole issue that just came up in the Del Rio sector is 60,000, what will be 90,000, they're unaccompanied juveniles. There are confirmed reports that a lot of family members, parents, were right up to the border, direct line of sights as the kids went and surrendered, right? And this is where, two weeks ago, I was talking to Kurt Lukowski, who's the commissioner of CBP, and he was saying, well, they're surrendering there. Well. Don't allow them to come in, and if they do come in, here's the difference. Put them on a plane and send them back immediately. Do not accept them. Here's a completely different categorization. We, we were on, uh, it was that Anderson Cooper was attacking me today, saying that, you know, this is a part of the immigration law. This is completely different. This is the first time we've had this issue because it's about refugees. For the president to term this as a humanitarian crisis, and call them refugees and to get, get process them, part of the $3.7 billion is to process them for asylum. A lot of these individuals have been coached. Here's what you say. You go to the border, you're fleeing violence, you're fleeing gang activity, and you would qualify under this part of the law. That's why this is so different and why that there is no consequences, there is no law here. And this is where there's a blanket over all of these individuals now, that he's terming it as a refugee status and that they're requesting asylum. The difference here, when straight up illegals are coming in, adults and their children and the drug smugglers coming in, that they're, it's not an asylum issue, it's not a refugee issue. And this is where this has got to stop this whole process of the refugee. Everybody's gonna be coming in now. Through. And the reason why they're doing it in Texas and not in Arizona and why we won't have that issue is a direct path from Central America. This is the most direct route for them there. And that's why they're just being overwhelmed and the Border Patrol just can't even handle this concern. So this is where consequences for us, that show of force at the border, that will absolutely deter most of the traffic. Again, what I said earlier, it's not going to be our problem anymore, but it's going to be a magnified issue for some other state, likely Texas. And, and by the way, I'm getting the high sign that we needed to shorten the question line, but the, the critical thing that occurred to me the other day is that, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen the news that the federal government affirmatively asked for 60,000 escorts to, to accompany unaccompanied minors as they were coming across the border back in January. So th this was no accident. This was no, oh my gosh, we have all these kids, what are we going to do about it? This was a planned, organized effort, which makes the President of the United States the head of the largest coyote operation in the history of mankind.
close to it. Okay. My name is Marcia Stewart. And this evening on the news before I came to this meeting, the feds say that the uh, funding for the border uh, security will be running out in August. What are your comments on that? I'm not sure what funding you're talking about. Do you know any, anybody the order 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 order? Order? What they're saying is because of this crisis that is over the undocumented, unaccompanied juveniles from Central America has put such a strain on their existing budget for Homeland Security that they're going to run out of funds. And this is part of what the, the president, is. this is an urgent emergency request for this $3.7 billion because, again, it's like turning up the scare everybody meter, right? right? Just like the sequester. That's what this is a part of, in an effort to get force Congress to give them $3.7 billion to continue the government for the most important functions, right? That Why? Is that the so part out. running out? Is that the select fund running out? Yeah. That's, that's what he's saying. And, and to, to the processing of the refugee concerns. <laughs>
tell you a quick story. I had a Seder. <laughs> I had a, a woman who, whose name is Zina come to my office. She immigrated from Ukraine 25 years ago. She was 45 when she immigrated, so she was a small kid coming with her parents. She's lived a, basically a lifetime in each country. She said to me in my conference room with tears streaming down her cheeks, Christine, exactly what I saw happening under the vestiges of the Stalin regime in Ukraine, I see happening in America. You have to become the governor because you have to preserve our freedom. Now, I very much respect her legal immigration story, and it is a story. I mean, this woman worked to become an American, okay? And she's right. It is up to us to preserve this freedom, okay? It's only a generation away from extinction, every minute. But I said to her, Sina, I'm just running for governor. I'm not running for God. <laughs> so I'm gonna do what I can do in Arizona, and I will work with the people that are our neighbors to the east and the west. But we have to do what we can do in this state. Because we can do what we can do in this state. Arizona is one of the last great free states in this country. Doggone it, let's preserve it here. Let's, let's make that commitment together. We're gonna preserve it here. We're gonna take this seriously. New Mexico, I hope they participate. They have a great Republican governor there. California? <laughs> <laughs> but but this, is, this is a really serious issue. Can you address the law enforcement? Absolutely. Issues? What's, what's gonna happen, and this is what uh, Christine and I have spoken about this. And, uh, what is the true estimate of what, what, how long is this going to take to secure the border? I believe uh, at the last date is a year from when she comes into the office. I believe it will be far quicker. Six to eight months, you're going to see such a dramatic improvement here in our state because of this massive deployment and this commitment from the executive of our, of our state. But what's going to happen is this is going to be an example for other governors. And it's going to apply so much pressure because we're going to prove the defeatist wrong, right? We said it couldn't be done. And this is a governor doing it. And you're going to see how can we afford not to do this, right, from a public safety perspective, but it makes sense financially. So every other state, that pressure in terms of does it make sense economically, it, it does. And you're going to see not only uh, Susana Martinez in Mexico, you're going to see Governor Perry in Texas, that pressure will be applied to them. And, and what a way to show up the federal government. Yeah. That governors, that the states are the answer and are the solution. Right now I can tell you absolutely there is, is a very minor issue of people coming from New Mexico into Arizona. It's the path of least resistance. This is why Christine talks about the, the fencing on high traffic, proven smuggling areas, because that's where you need to stop them. They're coming north. They want to immediately assimilate, and they go through a pass-through county canal on their way to Metro Phoenix. A lot of them stay, but most of them, in fact, leave to other states, right? And they're looking to go into the interior, and that's how we've ended up with 11 to 20 million in the country. So if we do this six to eight months, watch what happens. This is like our dream is going to come true, because she has the power. Of, it's not just a campaign promise. She has the power and authority as the governor to declare a state of emergency. And I believe all the, the examples we've given, we could argue that this is clearly a state of emergency. It's an invasion. And she could do this. So does that answer that for you? No, thank, thank you. you. I guess he just answered my initial question. But uh, my name is John Asmeno, and uh, I'm a Marine veteran. Just Thank you for your service. This is one of the case studies that we have. Is, uh, this is one of the case studies that we had in the legal immigration to SB 1070. Um, like I said, you answered my question where we have 6.5 million citizens, and 10% of that are the immigrants, which equates to 650,000 uh, illegal immigrants today. Now, it will take six to eight months. A lot of us have heard that before too as well. I mean, prior administrations have always said, we're gonna secure the border, and on top of that, on top of securing the border, we're gonna have a growth economy, and um, 
270 million dollars is your is your budget for for this whole thing. Six to eight six to eight months. I guess my question is, how accurate how accurate is six to eight months? Well, I can tell you what happened in Yuma because I live there. I live right off of Fortuna. Anybody who knows Yuma. Uh, and that's what we saw. We saw it in a shorter period of time. So I'm under-promising and prepared to over-deliver, right? That's what I'm going to do. And, and so this part of the plan that Christine has incorporated, she's vetted it based on what actually happened. And so what we're going to see, six to eight months that I'm saying, she's prepared, and she said this publicly numerous times, so I can restate it, that that's a year's worth of funding to pay for 1,200 active duty SAT, state active duty soldiers and airmen, and for equipment, and for the technology, and for the fencing. So if she's prepared to say, do two years of this, the, the 50, one, 50 million that are one-time expenses come off that 270, right? And we could sustain the operation. I'm saying, based on my own firsthand experience, that we're not going to need more than, I don't believe we're going to need more than the, the year. As long as that infrastructure, the fencing, because I'm a combat engineer, the fencing, the technology that complements it, and then the enforcement of the law. Most important thing of all of this is not the soldiers, it is, it is not the fencing or the technology, it literally is consequences. And that's where they see that visible show of force and that we're aggressive and we stand as one in the state and we're united about it, we have the answer. And we can't rely on the federal government, because if we do, we're going to be back here four years from now, right, talking about the same damn issue, I can guarantee you. And so that's where we've got to take matters into our own hands and say, we can solve this. And, sh and she has the power to do it. So this is where I absolutely believe, I'll come back here six to eight months, it, when and if it, our Christine is the governor, when. And come and read and when and, and be a part of that report back. I guess that's, that's a question for you. Now I guess it's a question for you, uh, for you man. Uh, I, I was an immigrant. I was from the Philippines. I did all the paperwork, did all the loopholes, spent the money, and all that stuff. Uh, when I got here, uh, my father uh, works for the Abbey Hospital right here. Um, he would come home. He would tell me. That it's almost unfair that for us, that who for us immigrants that did the paperwork and all that have no benefits, where where an pardon my language, an illegal Mexican um, can be in a hospital and have free stuff, have their have their medical stuff paid for, and not just that. This is what very I guess a slap in our face is for us that pays our tax bill. We're also providing them with interpreters. Interpreters. If you're, uh, in my, my opinion, if you're here, come on, let's speak English. And not just that. We have businesses all around, given all over the United States, but the majority here, here in Arizona. We all know that we have an illegal immigration problem. Then why do businesses here in Arizona condone? Right. Condone this work, it's not just that. And, and fools the system and, and twist the system around just so. And then once once they have once all these illegal immigrants are working and all of a sudden you doing your job, uh, taking them all out, now they're gonna say growth growth has been stunned. What what's your name? Sorry. Uh, my name is Joe Nazareno. Joe Nez? Not Nazareno. Joe Nazareno. Joe. Sorry, Joe Nazareno. Sorry, yes. That's okay. Where did you grow up? I, I grew up in the Philippines. Uh, oh, Whereabouts? Manila? Yes, I was in Manila. Um, I was in Malacana. Okay. Joe, first of all, thank you for being a legal immigrant. <laughs> by this problem than you. You, among all of us, should be the single most outraged. Because look what you did to get here. 
and look how proud you are. You're a Marine, you're a college graduate, you have perfect, flawless English. All of us should admire you. That's why I'm running for governor. 
There is no other reason for me to come out of my cushy private life and paint this target on my back and invite people to attack me, except that sometimes you just got to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So, I know if you're sitting here, you're going to vote. And I hope you vote for me. But would you find two other people that aren't otherwise going to vote and get them to vote too? He's volunteering to get five. Five works for you too. Just two people. You don't have to get 4,000, okay? Just two human beings. Because in this state, less than 10% of the population will pick the next governor. Let that sink in for a second. Less than 10% of those 6.5 million people that Joe just mentioned are going to pick the next governor. And that has not worked out so well for us in the past. I give you Jenna to call 10. <laughs> so, I know you're going to vote, and I hope you vote for me. Find two people that wouldn't otherwise vote to vote with you. I'm Christine Jones. I'm running for governor. I would love you.